All right, so in case there's a few people in this room that don't know this, but the, the financial crisis of 2008, which I had been forecasting for some time, and the Great Recession that ensued was caused predominantly by the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve did this by keeping interest rates artificially low in the aftermath of the bursting of the dot-com bubble, which they also caused. And, and by doing that, they were able to mitigate the recession that we had at that time. Now, the recession would have been more severe had the Fed done nothing, but it would have been more constructive because we would have basically rebalanced the economy and had a real recovery rather than a bubble, which is what we had. But of course, during that bubble, very few people realized or understood that we were in a bubble. Right? And the Federal Reserve uh, you know, lowered interest rates down to 1%, artificially held them there for about a year and a half, and then was very slow in allowing rates uh, to normalize. Right? And during that time period, we inflated this gigantic bubble. But of course, very few people, particularly Republicans, right, understood what was going on because George Bush was the president and all the Republicans wanted to believe that we had this great economy and it was Bush's fault, or it was not his fault, it was because of Bush policies, he cut taxes and everything was great. But I was going on financial television back when they still had me on and I was pointing out that this was all a bubble. Right, that this was all going to end in disaster because it was all a function of the artificial wealth created by the housing bubble, which was because of the cheap money. And as rates eventually rose and mortgage rates reset, the housing market was going to crash. It was going to take down uh, the banking system and we'd have this fantastic uh, recession and it would all get blamed on Bush. And I was saying this for years, uh, but most people were in denial, just like they are today. Right? Stephen Moore is going to be speaking right after me, and he's going to talk about how great the economy is. Well, he was saying the same thing back in 2006 and 2007, just like all of his friends. In fact, Art Laffer, uh, not Art Laffer, rather, um, Larry Kudlow, right, who is now the chief economic advisor to President Trump, he was the chief economics cheerleader on television for President Bush. I mean, nobody was a bigger promoter of the Bush bubble than Kudlow. And I know that because I used to go on his show on a regular basis and argue with him and all of the other guests that what we were witnessing was not economic growth, but a bubble masquerading as economic growth and that it was going to pop. Well, the problem is the bubble that the Fed inflated this time is far bigger than the housing bubble. And the economic collapse that is going to follow the bursting of this bubble is going to be far more dramatic because the Fed didn't just lower interest rates to 1%. They lowered them to zero. And they didn't leave them there for a year and a half. They left them there for seven or eight years. And then, rather than slowly normalizing interest rates, they never normalized interest rates because the bubble was so big they couldn't do that. And of course, the Fed, though, was bluffing for years and years that they could normalize interest rates, but, but they were lying. The Fed also was pretending that they could unwind their balance sheet, because not only did the Fed lower interest rates to zero, but we did three rounds of quantitative easing, right? The most recent one, QE3, and the Fed's balance sheet blew up to four and a half trillion dollars. But the whole time they were doing this, they were claiming it was an emergency, it was temporary, even from the very beginning when Ben Bernanke testified before Congress and somebody actually said, hey, you're monetizing the debt, which was exactly what he was doing, and then Bernanke denied that he was monetizing the debt because he said when you monetize the debt, it's a permanent increase in the balance sheet. We're just doing this temporarily. We're going to sell all of the treasuries that we're buying as soon as the emergency is over. Well, here it is more than 10 years later, and none of those treasuries have been sold. They're still owned, and in fact, even though the Fed doesn't want to admit it, they're already doing QE4, right? In the last four weeks, the Fed's balance sheet has grown by $180 billion in four weeks, right? And the Fed says that's not quantitative easing. Well, when they were doing quantitative easing, the balance sheet was growing at a much smaller pace than that 
QE3 was 85 billion a month. We did 180 billion in, in four weeks. But if you go back to the beginning, right, when the Fed first started to pretend that they could normalize interest rates and shrink their balance sheet, because I was warning from the very beginning that this was impossible, that the minute the Federal Reserve embarked on this monetary policy of 0% rates in QE, that they could never reverse it. Because the problems that we had in 2008 were because of an excess of debt, right? When you keep interest rates artificially low, <clears throat> When you hold interest rates artificially low, you're enabling more debt to be taken on. Well, if the problem was we had too much debt, the solution was to allow the debt to default so that we can have less debt and allow the economy to restructure, allow savings to be rebuilt. But that would have resulted in a more painful recession and politically nobody wanted that. So instead of you know, swallowing the medicine, we just took more drugs. And so we had this bigger bubble. But once the Federal Reserve encouraged all of this debt to be taken on, there is no way that they can normalize rates without causing a much greater financial crisis than the one that we had in 2008. So I kept warning that these policies were going to be never ending, that it would be QE infinity, that we would never stop. But the Federal Reserve kept pretending that they could, that they could normalize interest rates. Well, when 2015 began, the end of 2014, Everybody believed that the Fed was going to raise rates three or four times in 2015. Everybody but me, right? I was saying, and I was still on TV once in a while back then, I was coming out and saying, the Fed is bluffing, they can't raise rates, so they're not even going to try. They're not going to raise rates because there's too much debt, they can't raise rates. Well, the Fed didn't raise rates until December of 2015. And I think the only reason they did that was because by then, people were starting to get worried. Hey, what's, 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 why isn't the Fed raising rates? What do they know that we don't know? Right? And, and they were going to lose some credibility if they didn't raise rates. So they finally raised rates once in December 2015. And the markets immediately tanked. Now, that put the Fed on hold. And in fact, even though the markets went down, everybody still expected another three or four rate hikes in 2016. <coughs> The Fed did not raise interest rates until December of 2016. And the only reason they did that was because Donald Trump was elected president. Right? Had Donald Trump not been elected president, that would have been the only hike that the Fed did. And I would have been right, because I initially said when they hiked the first time that it was going to be one and done. And it would have been one and done, because had it not been for the election of Donald Trump, we would have been in a recession probably in the first half of 2017 and the Fed would have gone right back to zero, and they would have gone right back to QE. But when Donald Trump won, that created a lot of false optimism with respect to the U.S. economy. And of course, when Trump won, everybody knew that we were going to get tax cuts. What everybody didn't know was that we were also going to get increases in government spending. I mean, Donald Trump is one of the biggest spenders in history. Not only did he significantly increase spending on the military, he significantly increased spending on welfare. So we have more welfare spending, we have more warfare spending, and of course nothing was actually cut. So the entitlement you know, bomb continues to explode. And so we had this massive amount of fiscal stimulus. And so during that uh, time period where everybody was excited, everybody thought this was gonna be great and we're getting tax cuts and you know, we're gonna get deregulation, in that environment, the Fed was finally able to do what it couldn't do you know, under eight years of Obama, which was raise interest rates. And every time it notched interest rates up a quarter of a point, nothing really bad happened, so they kept doing it until uh, you know, finally they hit the straw that broke the camel's back. And I could see this happening. I actually was on Fox Business two days before the December rate hike in 2018. And I was on a panel, there was a few other guys there, and I told Liz Clayman, I was on her show, I said that the hike that we're about to get in December is the last hike we're going to have. And that was the first time I said that about any of the hikes, after, except for the first one where I thought it was one and done. But as soon as Trump won, I recognized that they were gonna be able to raise rates for a while. But I can tell by December of 2018 that the Fed was done. So I said on television, this is the last rate hike that we're going to have. The very next thing the Fed's going to do on rates is cut. 
Nobody thought that at that time. Everybody thought the Fed was going to continue to raise rates in 2019. In fact, I was on a panel in uh, Vancouver in January, and I said that the next thing the Fed's going to do is cut rates, and somebody thought that was so crazy, they, they bet me a gold coin that I was wrong. And, you know, I, I'm going to collect that coin, I think, the next time I'm up in Vancouver, because that's, that's exactly what they did. But on that show, not only did I say that the next thing the Fed was going to do was cut interest rates, I said after that, they're going to go back to quantitative easing. Right? And as I just said earlier, that is exactly what they've done. Right? The Fed is not willing to admit that. Right? Why doesn't the Fed want to admit that they're doing QE? Well, because they don't want to admit that the economy is in such bad shape that it needs to be rescued with quantitative easing. After all, we did quantitative easing when we had the Great Recession. We had a financial crisis. Why are we doing it now? I mean, if the economy is supposedly in a great place, which is what uh, Jay Powell keeps saying, he keeps talking about what a great place the economy is in. Of course, Ben Bernanke, his predecessor, you know, before Yellen, was saying the same thing in 2007. In fact, the Fed was claiming the economy was in a great place in mid-2008 when we were already in a recession. It's just that Ben Bernanke didn't know that, and neither does Jay Powell. But Powell does not want to scare the markets into thinking that we need quantitative easing. And of course, you know, the only reason that they started calling it quantitative easing was because they didn't want to tell the truth about what they were actually doing the first time, which was monetizing government debt, right? They wanted to come up with a nicer way of explaining what they were doing. But that's exactly what they're doing. And what is it that caused the Fed to have to reverse monetary policy? Well, the reason it had to start cutting interest rates was because the stock market was tanking again. They had raised interest rates to the point where the markets could no longer handle it. How high did we get? Two and a quarter? Two and a half? Is that normal? No, it's not even close to normal. That's about what the inflation rate is, at least the official inflation rate is. So we have zero interest rates, real interest rates in the United States. That's not normal. But also the economy started to implode. Look at what was happening with the housing market. It was imploding. The auto market was imploding. Already the, uh, the manufacturing, the industrial economy is in recession right now already. The, the numbers on the, uh, on the economy are as bad as they were on, on manufacturing, rather, since 2009. And so the Fed had to try to stop the hemorrhaging in housing and autos because that's very sensitive. Uh, to interest rates. And by the way, you know, you have record, low, record high auto debt. So you also have this huge auto bubble. So the Fed had to start cutting interest rates to try to keep the air from coming out of those bubbles. But what made them go back to quantitative easing? It was the recent blow up in, 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 the, uh, in the swap market, in the market for overnight funds. Well, why is this happening? Well, interest rates started to rise. In fact, short term rates went as high as maybe 10% even though the Fed has got a target on Fed funds of about one and three quarters, rates shot up. Why are rates shooting up? Because the deficits are exploding, right? The U.S. government right now needs to borrow about a trillion dollars a month. I mean, that is a lot of money, right? Where, where is that money coming from? Well, we have massive deficits, right? The national debt in the last year has increased by about a trillion and a half. Right? We've never seen anything like this. I mean, not even under Obama, during the worst part of the Great Recession, did we have budget deficits of this size. Right? So we're running these huge deficits. The, the government is borrowing new, more than $100 billion every month. Now, you can't look at the official budget deficit numbers. You have to look at how much the national debt is actually going up. Because the government, at least they're consistent, right? They lie about everything. And they can't even be honest about how much they're borrowing. But if you actually look at the national debt, you can see how much they're borrowing. So they have to borrow all this money, but they also have to refinance all the debt that's maturing because the national debt is financed at a very uh, short duration. And in fact, one of the other things that candidate Trump said that, thought that President Trump is doing the opposite is he promised to lengthen the maturity of the national debt Instead, he shortened it. And so there's a, there's a tremendous amount of, um, of debt that has to roll over. And there's not enough buyers. There's no savings there. So the markets want to bring up interest rates. The markets want higher interest rates. But the Fed doesn't want higher interest rates because everything is going to implode. All of the big banks that they bailed out will fail again. In fact, the stress tests 
that the, the Federal Reserve administered to all the banks, there wasn't a single test that, that factored in rising interest rates. They only wanted to find out how, what would happen to the banks if we had a recession and interest rates went down. But there wasn't a single test that, that measured what would happen to banks if interest rates went up and the economy was in recession. And the reason they didn't administer that test is, that, is because they knew that everybody was going to fail it. So they didn't want to do it. But now we're at a point where the Fed had to come back in and do quantitative easing. They had to print money out of thin air and buy up all those bonds to prevent interest rates from rising, which is what the market wants. But the Fed does not want that because of the short-term effects. Now, that is going to continue. right? The Fed is pretending it's not quantitative easing. The balance sheet is now almost back up to $4 trillion. And the, the amount of money that the Federal Reserve is going to have to create out of thin air to buy bonds is going to be much bigger now because we have a much bigger debt bubble. The national debt is $23 trillion. It was $8 trillion uh, when we had the last financial crisis. We have a lot more corporate debt now than we had then, a lot more consumer debt, a student loan debt, uh, credit card debt, auto debt, as I said. So it's a much bigger debt bubble, and the Fed is going to have to try to you know, blow a lot more air into it. The difference is... This time, it's not going to work. Everybody is convinced that it can work again. Well, the last time when the Fed launched QE and went to 0% interest rates, gold was at 1,000, which was an all-time record high, because in the preceding decade, it had risen uh, from under 300 to 1,000. And the dollar was at an all-time record low in 2008. And so when they started this program, initially the dollar rose. Uh, and gold initially fell, but then it went up to about 1900 in 2011 when people initially um, believed that the Fed's policies were going to end a disaster, which was the correct assumption. But then everybody started to believe the Fed, that the Fed's policies worked. But the, 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 the belief that the policy worked was completely predicated on the fact that it was temporary and that it was reversible, that the Fed was going to be able to normalize interest rates and shrink its balance sheet back down to pre-crisis levels. Well, when the balance sheet is $5 trillion, $6 trillion, $7 trillion, when we're back at zero, when we are back in recession, and by the way, this recession is going to get blamed on Trump, and we're going to have a socialist president in 2021 with a very sympathetic socialist Congress that is going to blame capitalism uh, unfairly for this crisis, just like they were able to blame it on the last crisis. But when this happens, nobody is going to believe that it's temporary. Nobody is going to believe that the Fed has this under control, that they can reverse this policy. And the dollar is going to crash. And when the dollar crashes, it's going to take the bond market with it. And we're going to have stagflation. We're going to have a deep recession with rising interest rates. And this whole thing is going to come imploding down. And then, you know, the Fed is going to have to make a very difficult decision as to whether it ultimately tries to save the dollar and prevent it from becoming monopoly money and really raise interest rates and just, you know, allow everything to implode, including forcing the U.S. government to default on its obligations, not only obligations to seniors as far as Social Security, Medicare, but actually obligations to bondholders uh, to pay interest on the debt, which it will una be unable to do. Or the Fed is going to avoid, or to try to avoid that, the Fed is going to just, you know, end up with hyperinflation because they're not going to be willing to do what is necessary uh, to prevent that from happening. And so I think now, I think I'm out of time, but <clears throat> people now more than ever need to be prepared. If, if you were blindsided by the 2008 financial crisis, okay. You know, as long as you wrote it out, the Fed saved you. The Fed bailed you out by inflating an even bigger bubble. But it's not going to happen this time. You've got to bail yourself out now. The Fed's not going to do it for you. There's just one chance uh, to get this right. And not only can you preserve your wealth, but you can actually profit uh, as this bubble deflates. And I'm going to be talking about that at, what, 1.30 in this room tonight. So make sure, or t this afternoon. So make sure you're back, because that's where I'm really going to get into what's going to happen and how you can profit from it. Thanks.